but welcome everyone. Fantastic to see so many people here. Uh, hopefully we're going to have an interesting event for you tonight. Uh, we're going to start off with me talking a little bit about uh, Neo, the story, uh, from a startup perspective. Um, and then we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session, and then we're going to have an, a panel debate with uh, very interesting people and me. <laughs> it's the plan. Um, I thought we'd kick it off a little bit with actually getting to know the audience a little bit better. After that, we're only going to be talking about me for 40 minutes. So let's start with a little bit of getting to know the audience. Raise your hand if you are an entrepreneur. So, probably half. That's awesome. Uh, raise your hand if you're an investor. One, two, three, four, five, something like that. Just trying to calibrate you know, how harshly I can joke about VCs. Good to know. <laughs> Uh, raise your hand if you write code for a living, if you're a developer. Pretty much the same people who are entrepreneurs, <laughs> which is a good thing. All right, awesome, fantastic. My name is Emil A. Uh, and I'm the founder of a startup called Neo Technology. Uh, we're the commercial sponsor of an open source project called Neo4j, N-E-O, the number 4J, which is a graph database. Uh, out of the people who are developers, uh, how many in here have used Neo4j? At least once. How many have put Neo4j in production? So, one, two, three. Awesome, fantastic. So, the agenda for today is super simple. Uh, the agenda for my talk, I should say. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit of grounding, talking about Neo, April 2015 talk about where we are today to give you context, and then after that, we're gonna talk about the story, uh, what's led us up to this point, um, and then we're gonna sort of conclude with some lessons learned, what, what have we learned today. And I will make no guarantees that they're applicable to your world, uh, but there are some of the sort of high order bits that we've, that we've learned today. Um, so Neo today, uh, before we kick, kick it off, actually I should say that um, I only have re really one ground rule for all my talks, but that ground rule is really, really important and I want all of you to adhere to it, uh, which is that I do not want your undivided attention. <laughs> so we're in Sweden now, we have the huge benefit of compared to where I live right now in Silicon Valley, where phones work, <laughs> the internet works most of the time, so use it, uh, tweet uh, about this, let me know if I'm doing good or if I'm doing bad. Uh, the only thing that I do ask of is that you use the Neo4j hashtag because I monitor that one religiously. And feel free to throw in a sub 46 as well uh, for good measure. Cool. Um, so let's start off interactively. Uh, I have six companies on this slide. Can someone tell me one thing that all six of these companies have in common? No need to raise your hand, just, just throw it out there. Internet. Internet. Good idea. Yes. Any other? Maybe they use Neo4j. Use Neo4j. Great example. Actually, not true. We do work with a lot of these, but not every one of them. Any other suggestions? They have graphs. They use graphs. Great idea. I was at a conference uh, yesterday, and someone looked at it and said, their logos have the color blue. <laughs> Which I thought was like, okay, I want to hire you. <laughs> You're awesome. I want to hire you immediately. Um, but no, that's not. I have, a, I have a hugely, you know, important point about this and about some trends in the world. But he actually caught me off guard. I'm like, maybe it is because of the color blue. But but that's not it. Um, the key thing, and we someone alluded to this before, is that. All of these six companies are leaders in their category. They're all market winners, right? Google, Facebook, PayPal, etc. And they all became market winners because they did a shift in perspective. They said that our industry has always or is now based on data, um, but data in isolation, data in silos is very valuable, but it's also very val valuable to look at connections in data. And what happens if I reimagine my business along relationships in data, along connections in data? What will, what will that do to the world? 
right? And the most stark example of this, I think, is search engines in the late 90s, right? How many remember any of these names? Alta Vista, Excite, Lifeis. Yeah, most people actually, archaeologists too, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I grew up as a, as a professional programmer, as a somewhat professional programmer in the, in the mid-90s. And I remember hearing about what these companies did, right? So we have this new data structure out there, out there called the web, right? And it's growing at this extraordinary pace. It doubles in size every week or something ridiculous like that, right? So these companies say, hey, you know what? Let's download the entire web into our data centers, like all web pages into our data centers. And when you search for Stockholm, right, we're gonna look inside each and every one of these documents. And if the document contains Stockholm, we're gonna deliver it back as a search result to the user. And oh, by the way, we're gonna do this, download the entire web every day. For how long? Forever, right? Amazing, I just remember that. I was like, that's extraordinary, an extraordinary accomplishment, right? Very impressive, but then along came this small startup, which said, let's do that, but on top of that, we're gonna look inside of every document, and there's gonna be a link in there. It's gonna be wrapped in a tag called ahref, right? Which links documents together, which is what creates the web, right? We're gonna extract that, and we're gonna use that as a ranking mechanism for the search result, right? So it's not enough to just have pages that include the word Stockholm, but we're gonna have a link to a page indicates a vote, so to speak. So if many people link to a certain page, it's an important page, right? Of course, that tiny little startup was Google, and that algorithm is known as PageRank. Actually, not after web page, it's after Larry Page, the founder, one of the two founders of Google. Um, and that's the key moment, that shift in perspective where they said that data in isolation is very valuable, but connections in data is super, super valuable, and that's what creates the the most important company, or at least the previous decade in my mind. A completely transformational company. One shift in perspective. They got the idea, but on top of that, they also built the technology stack, which was shaped from the ground up around relationships. So what would that give you if you do that? In, in one way of looking at what we do is that we take that technology stack that Google built in, internally in order to revolutionize web search, and we make that available to people to use off the shelf, right, for whatever industry they're, they're working in, right? And what would a technology like, like, like that look like, right, that allows you to use relationships? Well, rather than working with tabular abstractions, so the building blocks being tables with rows and columns, uh, it may expose something like this, where we have nodes and then type relationships between the nodes that connect them, which builds up a network which in mathematical lingo is called a graph, right? So that's the essence of our product. And for those of you who came here for product information, that's it. That's all I'm gonna say about our product. <laughs> Not quite, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more and focus on what then are the benefits. Like if you have a database that with the key abstractions, the key building blocks are nodes and relationships and then key value pairs on them, like what kind of benefits do you get out of that, right? And I think the most stark example of this is performance, right? It gives you some softer development time benefits as well, but performance is really the starkest example uh, of a benefit, right? And a long time ago, we were contacted by a big social network that you've heard of, and they said, hey, um, you know what? If, um, if you look at the world, it's shaped very graphy. Our world is very graphy. We've looked at all these new types of databases, the Cassandras and the Mongos and the key value stores, the Reacts of the world. Actually, this is maybe before you react. And we think they're all amazing and, and valuable, but really our world is a graph, right? And your model fits perfectly with what we're trying to do. And however, we're big social network X, and the only thing that we really care about is performance, right? Um, so what they asked us was, can you show us some benchmarks on how, how you're doing? And us being the honest Swedish geeks that we are, we said, you know the saying, right? There's uh, lies, damn lies, statistics, and then benchmarks, right? <laughs> so we said, no, we don't do benchmarks, actually, but give us a scenario that is relevant to you, and then we'll show you how fast we are to that scenario, right? And the scenario they gave us was that, imagine that you have a 1,000 people 
everyone has 50 friends on average, grab two people at random and check to see if they're connected, right? We implemented that using another open source Swedish uh, database uh, called MySQL. Um, and the response time was 2,000 milliseconds, right? With a thousand person network, right? Which is slow. In fact, it's too slow to be able to use it in real time with, with, in the web policy, right? So we implemented this with Neo4j, and it's a two millisecond operation. It was like, yay, you know, a thousand times faster. That's significant, significantly faster. Uh, but it's also what we're supposed to be able to do, right? For those of you who have heard of the term NoSQL, who here has heard of NoSQL? Most people, awesome. So basically, I mean, the bigger narrative of NoSQL is choose a data model that fits the data at hand, right? And when you do that, you can get these kind of benefits a thousand times faster. But we didn't stop there. We actually added a thousand times as much data. It was a million, million people, still 50 friends on average, 25 million total connections in the network, grabbed two people at random, and it's still a two millisecond operation. And with MySQL, this is like weeks. This is a kind of very, very stark order of magnitude type benefits that you can get when you use a graph database for what it's good at. Another number of things where a graph database isn't awesome, for example, if you have very tabular shaped data, you should use a relational database, an SQL database. But if you have a lot of connections and they're valuable, then a graph database can give you these type of benefits. So we're not the only people saying this. Uh, we used to be the only people saying this, as you'll hear when I start talking about the history of the company. But now we have big ana analyst firms like Gartner saying it's the most important thing yet that you can do outside of getting data into your system. Right? Which I think is an amazing quote. Forrester, the other big leading analyst, says that 25% of the enterprise will be using graph databases in production in just a few years, um, which is pretty amazing. There's a site out there uh, called DB Engines, which tracks popularity of, of these different types of databases. And graph databases have outpaced every other category inside of databases for the past two years, right? Loss of popularity. To be completely intellectually honest, like out of the NoSQL categories, graph databases is currently also the smallest, right? So which makes it easier to grow at this, at this type, of, uh, type of pace. But these type of growth rates, you don't sustain, sustain them for much longer without actually really starting to catch up. It's a pretty amazing thing. So that's sort of summary of where we are today. That's not where we started. Uh, things were smaller back then. In fact, we started back in 2000, way back in the days, right? I mean, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? Back in 2000. And the, the three founders were working at the small Swedish startup that even, even if I'm talking here in Stockholm, people haven't heard of, where we built enterprise content management systems. And one of the things that we tried to solve was that we had a bunch of images, and these images were uploaded not just by us, but by other people, photographers. And we wanted them to be able to tag the images with something, um, and then make that searchable, right? Makes sense? Um, the problem was that the photographer may be in Spain, and then he won't tag this with house. He will tag this with casa, right? And someone who searches may be from Germany, so they're gonna search for Das Haus, right? Um, so really what we wanted to be able to do is to have the system automatically translate this. So what we wanted to do then, conceptually, was we wanted to build a little bit of a structure where we say that there's an abstract thing called house, which has an English term, house, and casa is the same as this abstract concept of house, and Das Haus is the same thing, right? Uh, we wanted to be a little bit more sophisticated than that, actually. So the abstract notion of house, actually, let's call that a building, right? Because a house is a building. So if someone searches for dust building, do we have someone, who, any German speakers in the audience? Yes, but what is what is building in, in German? Gebäude. Gebäude. Yeah, well, is it der, das, die? Das. Das, yeah, das, yeah, that's what I thought. Das Gebäude, right? So you search for das Gebäude, right? And then you want someone to be able to find something that has been tagged with CASA, right? Seems like a pretty simple, trivial thing. Look, there's only a few lines and boxes on the, on the slide, so it has to be simple, right? Um, turns out that this problem was very difficult to solve 
with the traditional tooling that was available to us in the infrastructure, right, called the relational database. I'm gonna talk through the NEO story uh, through a model of projects that I like. It's called transition curve theory. Has anyone here heard of transition curve theory? No one. So basically it walks through five phases of, let's call it a startup, right? So the first phase is uninformed optimism. I don't know if you can make it out, but step one, you're starting out, you're thinking like this is such a great idea that there's no way, no one can fail. As long as you have this idea, you can't fail. That's how good this idea is. The world deserves it. I'm just gonna build it. Everyone will come and use it because it's so amazing, right? That's step one. Step two, as you start to learn it, you realize this is kind of difficult to build. And in fact, what's this whole lean startup customer like? I'm supposed to talk to my customers and see what they actually want. I don't, I don't get that, but like, because when I talk to them, they don't say that they want this amazing thing that I'm about to build. So why is that, right? And you start realizing that, wait, how do I get, actually get people to know about this brilliant idea that I have? And you get to the informed pessimism stage, right? You realize like, this is really fucking hard, right? And it's good, but like, I don't know if I can build it, right? It all goes downhill from here, by the way, right? So, so basically after that, you work, you work, and you work, you try to understand the problem, you understand more of it, and then you get to the crisis of meaning, right? Am I gonna be able to do this or not? And from there, there are two paths. The first one is the crash and burn phase, right? And the second one is you power through, you pivot, you iterate, you make it work, and finally you get to the informed optimism. Yes, it was a great idea, it does deliver value, it has a bunch of challenges, but the challenges are well understood. I'm now powering through, and you hopefully end up building a successful company. Transition curve theory, it's 2000, and we're here, right? And we look glorious. <laughs> this is us back in 2000. There are three founders of Neo4j, Emil, Johan, and Peter. Um, and this is me, <laughs> Emil, this is uh, Peter, and this is you won, except it's my friend you won, not the co-founder you won. This is another you won, because I couldn't find a picture of all three of us <laughs> at the same time. So I used my mad Photoshop skills. So this is now a picture of, of, of the three founders of me every day. Look good. Um, and so we're fighting with this problem, right? Where we had this mismatch of data structure and representation, and we're saying like, how can we make this work? And we start thinking about it, we realize that, wait, what if we had a database which rather than exposing tables, exposes nodes and relationships between nodes, and then key value pairs in them, right? The kind of technology that I outlined before. Wouldn't that be amazing? And we saw that, hey, hand, glove, this fits perfectly, right? So let's build it. Well, actually, the first thing we did is that we didn't want to build that. We were building enterprise content management systems, and then, like, you don't want to build your own database, because take it from me, building a database is hard, right? You don't want to start there. Um, but so we started not Googling around, we started Alta Vistaing around and life kissing around and exciting around, um, but didn't find anything, right? So then finally, you know, I was young and arrogant back then, and finally we just said, fuck it, let's just build it. How hard can it be? As it turns out, 15 years later. <laughs> it, it was pretty hard. Uh, but we spent a lot of time building it, and this is all, remember, inside of, a, of another startup, right? So this is not Neo, uh, the, the startup Neo, but inside of this enterprise content management. We built it for seven years. Uh, we put it in production, actually in 2003, after about a year, year and a half of development. We built the, the new generation of that startup's uh, product on top of this. We always thought of it as something generic. We thought we'd found something incredibly valuable. We also saw that in the industry, if you talk to random developers in 2003 or 2004, they would generally tell you that, look, the relational database is there and it's gonna be there forever. It's like a mathematical axiom. We're gonna have innovation in data, but it's all gonna build, be built on top of the relational database. That was sort of the, the, the discourse in our industry, if you will, at the time. Um, so we said, okay, you know, we think this is really awesome, we think it's widely applicable, but there does not seem to be any acceptance of bringing a new type of database to the market. Um, so let's just keep it internally as our own competitive advantage, if you will, our secret weapon. We'll be able to build systems that are much better 
and faster, and we'll be able to build them much better and faster using this technology. So let's do that, right? And then in 06, something very interesting happened. Google published an academic article called Big Tail, where they said that, hey, you know, world, like we've been handling this whole thing with data for quite some time, and we have insane amounts of data, and we tried using a relational database, but it didn't work. And we were forced to build our own database. And the same is true for Google, right? I mean, if your if your business model, if your company is about selling ads, you don't want to start out by building your own database, right? So they didn't take that decision lightly. And then in 07, Amazon published another research article, academic article, called Dynamo, where they said, hey guys, you know, we've also built a pretty big system using a lot of data. We also had to go away from the relational database to do it. And we call it Dynamo, and here's how it works, etc. And all of a sudden, the discourse in the industry changed. All of a sudden, there were articles at popular developer forums saying, uh, is this the end of the relational database? The death of the relational database? And, and, and things like that. Right? And we thought that, hey, this is kind of interesting. Maybe now there's a better tolerance, a better acceptance in the market for bringing a new type of database out there. And for whatever reason, we, at this point in 2007, We've been working on this for seven years, right? So we had a pretty polished and what we thought was an awesome product, right? So let's see if we can take this out, spin it out as a separate company, um, and actually bring it to the market. And a couple of steps preceding that was that we actually weren't even sure that we wanted to build a company around it. Uh, we, we came from an open source background and said, like, the most important thing is that this thing becomes used, right? Because we thought it was, Awesome, and we were like super arrogant about it, and saying things like like the world deserves this, and, and things like that. Um, but we felt that okay, maybe just open sourcing it is the right way to do, uh, the right way to go, and and have other jobs and do this in our in our free time. But after we spent a little bit more time thinking about it, we realized that well, as a, as a society, we kind of figure out that a great way of organizing resources is through companies, right? Because then you can fund then long term. Um, so maybe we can actually make a startup around this. And so that's what we ended up doing. Um, we, I was actually studying in Lean Sheffing at the time. Uh, so uh, we got into the lead incubator uh, in, in Lean Sheffing. And at the end of 2007, we raised a tiny little seed round from Innovationsbroen, actually from the local chapter of Innovationsbroen, uh, one and a half million Swedish kroners. Um, which was really our first funding, and that's when we started being able to focus on this full time. So we left the, the previous year and, and did this full time. So that's 2007, and now we're definitely here, right? We're very uninformed, but we're very optimistic, right? We have some amount of funding, you know, we have an actual company, we spun out the IP, and there's a clear path between us and success, and it's maximum 14 to 18 months, right? Um, that turns out to be marginally correct, let's say. Um, a lot of people look at this and they say, wait, what just happened? Seven years, right? And you, the only thing you did was focus on product, right? And, uh, and that's true, that is pretty shocking. And for, for the entrepreneurs in, in the room, especially for the, in the Venn diagram, the intersection of people who could code and people who are entrepreneurs, you will for sure have a lot of people telling you typically in a belittling fashion, that the te best technology doesn't always win. The best product doesn't always win, right? As a, as a technical founder, you always have people tell you that, particularly by people who understand business but not technology, because people who understand business but not technology think that you cannot understand both business and technology. So the fact that you understand technology then logically means you don't understand business. Ergo, we're gonna tell you in very simplified terms that you shouldn't focus that much on product, you need to figure out the business model, right? And business model and execution of the commercial side of a company is massively important, right? It's the difference between getting to $8 million in sales this year or $10 million in sales, which is almost, from some perspectives, everything that matters, right? But at the end of the day, though, the ultimate trajectory of a company is controlled by the product, the angle of the product and how the product fits with the market. And the time that I invest in the product, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately actually, for those of you who are using it, maybe fortunately, 
I don't contribute code to Neo4j anymore. I do spend a lot of time on the product and driving product direction in the product surface. And it's probably the most valuable time that I can do, aside from people. Lesson number one. We walk into 2008, we've just raised this small seed round, but by and large, we're doing a lot of bootstrapping, right? So we're working with customers. We thought of them as customers. They were customers. They were paying us money. But today, I would not think of them as customers. They were mainly consulting deals. No one actually bought the product, but they bought us building systems using the product, right? Um, we have ourselves as one customer, the previous company. Uh, but then also a few of the universities in, in Sweden and a couple of other, other people, right? A lot of bootstrapping. Uh, but another thing that we do, and really what we end up investing the one and a half million Swedish kroner that we raised, was this. It's time for interactive moment again to wake you up. Does anyone recognize this picture? What is this? This is House of Sweden in Washington, D.C. Right, so the Swedish embassy in Washington, D.C., an absolutely magnificent building, super beautiful. And there was this event there in 2008 that invited the, the 10 best startups in Sweden, which is always a joke. Right? Whenever like, there's a, any list with the 10 best, best whatever, it's, it's always a joke, completely arbitrarily chosen. Right? I happened to be in this incubator, which knew someone who was going there, and blah, 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 so we were on that list. Right? Were we amongst the top 10 best? I have no idea, I think we were, but like, I, I certainly don't think that being on a list like that warrants you any actual credit. However, it may open doors for you, right? And that's what it did for us. So basically we went to this, this event at the Embassy of Sweden in Washington, DC, and pitched American VCs for the first time. This is the first time that we tried our story in America. I've always been very Americanized. I lived in the US for a year in mid 90s. I've had um, a better social network, a better professional network in the Valley even, even 10 years ago. Um, but didn't know if this story worked in the US. Right? So we wanted to try that out. And we pitched and it went really well, got a lot of positive feedback, got invited over to the West Coast, Silicon Valley, uh, to talk to some of the, the absolute top tier Silicon Valley firms at the time. Right? So super positive. Did a little bit of that, then realized, okay, we need to go back and really build our story here. So went back and spent a lot of time building out a deck, thinking through all the various parts of the business and all those good things, whilst also investing in the product, trying to spend time with the customers and like all of those good things, right? Um, during that summer, summer 2008, we also tried out the story by talking to a number of Swedish VCs, right? Scandinavian VCs broadly. Um, and got some amount of traction with them. In particular, one firm said, hey, you know, I was, I was raising 30 million Swedish kroner at the time. And they said, hey, we can't really do 30 million alone, but we can do 15 million. Either we do 15 million now and complete round 15 million, or we do 15 million and someone else does 15 million, right? Which is called a syndicate, right? Syndication partner. You have a lead partner and a syndication partner. Um, the young and naive CEO then did his first of many mistakes, right? And said, hey, would it be okay if you guys, let's say we do the 15 million, but then I go over to Silicon Valley and I try to find the other 15 million. Would you be okay with that? Well, there's not a single Scandinavian VC who would not be okay with that. And if you walk through that, that decision tree, there's no leap in there which has upside for me, right? If I go over there and they say yes, they're likely to sweep in and just take the entire deal by themselves, right? If I, on the other hand, if they say no, I go over there and say no, I'm gonna come back tarnished, like, wait, why didn't you, or weren't you able to raise from the valley? Do they see something that we don't see? So that was no, up, no upside for me of doing that, but I didn't know that at the time. Uh, so I flew over there and I pitched. And uh, at this time, we're getting a little bit more traction on the customer side, still no real paying customers, we had a bunch of very interesting proof of concepts. This is classic enterprise software. So the path is typically, you start out, you know, someone plays around with your product and then they do a proof of concept and then you fly in your, your awesome salespeople and you sit down with them and you arm wrestle and then you go through procurement and it's a very long journey from start to point A to point B. And we were in the proof of concept with some really interesting ones. And by far the most interesting one was in finance. And finance, as we all know, 
and apologize to the VCs in the room, which belongs to a happier part of finance at least, but finance is where all the money is made and none of the value is created, right? Entrepreneurs create the value and finance manage that value and make all the money, right? Um, but that's good to sell into finance then, right? Because then we get some of the money back, right? And, and they're also awesome at uh, running capitalism when they're profitable and socialism when they're making a loss, which is a fantastic <laughs> business model. Uh, but anyways, so the most amazing one was in finance. It was a big top tier investment bank who was using us as part of, who was evaluating us as part of an investment trading platform, right? So you can t totally see how that's a great use case. Um, I walk in there, Monday morning, I fly out from Castro, Copenhagen Airport. Monday morning, take an early fly, fly over to the US, and you know how it works when you fly in that direction. On the clock, it takes three, four hours, right? The whole time is three, four hours because, jet, uh, because time zones uh, subtract the rest. So I, I land there like early afternoon to the news. Uh, do you remember September of 2008? Looked like this, right? And that investment bank of ours, it was called Lehman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and I land and Lehman Brothers was bankrupt, right? And I, was just, I, like, I just could not grasp that, right? And I don't know if you remember how we talked about this as, as as a society, right? It was like, this may be, this is it, like end of capitalism. Capital, capitalism doesn't work, right, basically, was a lot of the discourse back then, right? Um, and Lehman Brothers going bankrupt, that's like a mountain going bankrupt, right? Or something like that, it's just completely unheard of, right? I remember sitting down with some, some friends uh, from the valley, like that evening, jet lag, and they asked me, so, okay, so what are some of the cool things that people are doing with their technology? And I described Lehman Brothers, saying, yeah, well, Lehman Brothers is doing this. Just because I couldn't even grasp the fact that they didn't exist anymore. It was unfathomable to me. I wake up Tuesday morning, you know how in the mornings after jet lag, you're super white, you know, alert and, and awake, and just basically took my deck and just you know, scratched it all up and threw it away and redrew it from scratch, right? So that was the start of our fundraising process in America. Happy day. So we were one month in, in the US, month of September, um, and pitched a lot of people. Uh, one firm we pitched was a firm called Sequoia. How many here has heard of the firm Sequoia? It is the number one VC on the planet, according to any definition, basically. Um, and my other story about September of 2008 is that I was actually in the Sequoia room when they released this deck, which is amazing reading. Like if you, it's, it's available in SlideShare. Rest in peace, good times. The deck of doom that Sequoia released in September of 2008, which outlined all the reasons why every single startup that is trying to raise money now won't. And pretty much every startup that is not super well-funded, read between the lines by Sequoia, is very likely to go under, right? And that single deck cut all valuations in Silicon Valley in half just by releasing that deck. Very smart move, I would say. We talked to a bunch of firms, actually had a lot of progress, um, had really good conversations, but at the end of the day, like people didn't fund anything in general, and much less like this random firm from Sweden, right? Who's like whose headquarter is over in Malmo with like one of those O's with two dots on, right? I mean, that's not definitely not focused, but fund that, right? So what we do then is that we realize, okay, let's cut our losses early and fly back to Sweden, talk to that Scandinavian VC who said, hey, let's do this alone 15 million or as a syndication 30 million. They were willing to do it alone, so we went back to them and said, hey guys, you know that alone, like you guys are doing it alone? That sounds like a great idea, let's do that. And they say, sorry Sam, it was a completely different world back then. Uh, our, our uh, policy now is to not fund any, we're still interested, but we can't fund anything alone. We need a syndication partner. So I'm like, all right, we need a syndication partner. Like, all right, cool. So let's try to find a syndication partner. So we spent some time. Oh, by the way, yeah, this is where we're here, right? We're starting to get very informed about how hard this thing is actually, actually is. But so we spent some time in Scandinavia and tried to find someone who would be willing to syndicate with, with our lead. Um, and they ended up, we ended up finding someone, actually out of, out of Finland, who said, 
hey, yeah, this sounds awesome. Let's do this. We had some experience with MySQL, which ended up being an okay outcome. Um, so let's let's do this. And so in January of 2009, we actually signed a term sheet. How many in here know what a term sheet is? Hands up. So it's basically, you can think of it as a letter of intent that describes an investment, that outlines the investment in simple language, at least simpler than it can be, so si relatively simple language, the broad terms about an investment, right? They're not binding at all, uh, but they're sort of morally, yeah, let's stick to this when we actually go into it and produce what is the ultimate outcome of that process, which is a shareholder's documentation, which is not six to eight pages, it's 300 pages, and written in absolute legalese, so it's quite incomprehensible, even if you take time and read through all those 300 pages. Um, and the process after you sign a term sheet is that the VC will do due diligence on you, they're gonna look into your books, they're gonna look, do an IP infringement, look into patents on your software, they're gonna talk to customers if you have them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and concurrently with all this, you take that, those six to eight pages of term sheet and you translate them to the 300 pages of legalese. Um, and that's what you finally sign, and that's when the investment is done. You lose shares, you get dollars into the company, you can hire people, the world is your oyster, etc. Right? So we get to that point, March 18 of 2009, which is a Monday, um, when we finally, that evening, we get agreement amongst all the parties, like all the parties on my side, my existing investors, remember I had Innovationsbron, the Swedish government branch, which I guess doesn't exist anymore, it's part of Almi now, I guess, was one shareholder and had a bunch of other shareholders. Well, not a bunch, a few other shareholders, mostly the founders. Um, and the two VCs were all in agreement. Finally, we have this, this document and it's, it's, it's about ready to sign. Tuesday morning, I booked my, my train from Malmö up to Stockholm. And for Wednesday morning, we're gonna sign, champagne, all that good stuff, right? Except Tuesday morning, the lead partner at the lead firm calls me up and he says, uh, hey, sit down, but it's actually like 9 a.m. in the morning, so I was in bed. So I was like, no, I'm already lying down, but it's cool. And he says, look, uh, this is the deal. I'm leaving the firm, and we can't do the deal. And this is March 19, uh, so this is six days before payroll in Sweden. And we had 300,000 kroner in the bank account in January, but we spent all that on DD, because remember, and. I'm not even gonna say sorry to the VC community. In crazy VC world, like the company pays for all of the DD, right? The company pays for the lawyers, like all of the patent stuff, etc. So we have 18,000 kroner in the bank account, right? And this is fail. <laughs> this is painful fail. And this is when we're here, right? Six people in the company, uh, 18,000 kroner, six days to payroll, right? Um, I don't remember thinking that morning, actually, I'm thinking two things. First one is, I still love my job. I truly love what I'm doing. I think what we're doing is amazing. And the second one thinking, this can be a great story if we survive it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we hustle, we take those six employees that we have, and we, like, at the, that afternoon, all of them were out consulting, right? And consulting, as you all know, is basically prostitution, right? <laughs> You're implementing someone else's ideas and dreams, right? Uh, and then um, we take those invoices. I convince the customers that I can send invoices early, which I now know is illegal, at least in America. <laughs> By the way, is this being recorded? Damn it. <laughs> we didn't send them early. Um, and then we took the invoices that we didn't send early. Uh, and we sold them to a factoring firm, which is a financial uh, company that buys invoices for 80% of the value, but you get the money immediately. We got our one shareholder with money, in to put in 150,000 kroner. So we got some money into the company, we got some cash flow, and started happening. Right? But here's lesson learned number two. Right? None of this would have been possible, not because of my passion, not because I love what I do, but because of those other four employees, the, the non-founders, right? who truly were so passionate about what we, do, what we did. One of them said, this is just too good to not get funded eventually. 
And they ended up going out and building all kinds of boring systems just to get cash into the company so that we would survive. Passion is not an optional ingredient, it's a required ingredient. Otherwise, you'll never survive the, the highs and lows and the, the pain and the awesomeness of running a startup. So this is where I am right now. <laughs> right. All right, screw this whole VC thing. I'm just going to build a company. I'm going to go out. I'm going to build a product. I'm going to deliver it to customers. It gives, gets value out of it. We're going to use that to fund the company. We're going to build a real company, real value. Right? Um, so we do that for a while. And then I get contacted by a, a Danish VC that I had talked to before. And he said, hey, I want you to apply to this European tech tour thing because it's an amazing competition. Um, and you should be there. Uh, it's the top 20 best startups in South Sweden. Um, and I think you're one of them, right? So I said basically this, uh, and said, no, I'm not focusing on that right now. And said, fine. And then he calls me back a few days later and says, no, I, I, I don't accept that. You're just too good for this. And I said, fine, I'll take 20 minutes. I'm gonna fill out your damn form because all of these things have these forms where you fill out your business ID in 13 words, and then your business model in 443 characters, and then your distribution strategy in rhyme. Right? I mean, they have all these <laughs> weird things, and it's like awkward, and you have to redo them for every single one. It's just, it's a horrible thing. So I'm going to invest 20 minutes, no more. I'm going to fill this out, and and then see what happens. I did do that, and lo and behold, we got accepted. Um, I pitched, and. At that event, actually, another Danish VC came up called Sunstone Capital, and they said, and I built the relationship, I worked with them, uh, well, I talked to them for about a year, so I knew them from before, and they said, this is awesome. We really want to fund this, uh, except we can't do it alone. We need a syndication partner. <laughs> but luckily enough, we then had this Finnish syndication partner from before called Connor Venture Partners. So we called them up, said, hey, there's a lead now, again, let's do this. And we ended up closing our first round of funding. Two and a half million dollars. Uh, we called it the seed round. And we're barely, barely here. Right? Which felt fantastic. We hired those, those first six people, some of which were part-time. We hired them full-time. We started investing in the product. We open sourced. Uh, we started focusing on community um, and did a lot of amazing things. Since then, on the fundraising side, we've gone on to raise more money, uh, 10 million, or almost 11 million in 2011 and in 2012. And just recently, we uh, raised $20 million from Creandum, who's gonna be on the, the panel later today, and Dawn Capital, and a few others. Um, and it's very easy when you start talking about sort of the journey to tie it to fundraising. But at the end of the day, fundraising isn't what matters, right? What matters is getting your product in the hands of customers that derive value from it. And what really matters when it comes to that is get building an organization that can then build the product. And my role has transitioned from being built from building the product to building the organization that build the product. And one of the key lessons learned here is, and I hesitate to put this into decks like this because it's such a truism, but it truly is true, which is people is the highest order debt by far the highest order there, which is, and the, um, well, I have a few ways to talk through that. We're running pretty short on time. I'm gonna take three, four minutes to wrap up. Um, and I have a number of stories around this, but the one that I wanna highlight is hiring our first non-technologist into the company, which was uh, uh, a gentleman that I uh, didn't know from before, uh, but that a lot of people introduced before, back, introduced me to back in 2011. Uh, a, a guy called Lars Nordvall, which is a Swedish name, but he's lived in the US for, for 15 years and was based in the Valley. And this is uh, just before we raised our big round in 2011. Um, and he joined with an extraordinary track record and has been absolutely transformational for the company. And you can sort of look at who I was back in 2009 and 2010 and said that if that dude is lucky, right, me may be able to build a great tech team, right? And I've been incredibly lucky, and all the technologists that we've hired are way better at that than I am, which is, I think, how you have to hire. Um, but it's not clear that I was be, would be able to hire awesome sales and marketing, right? And bringing a person on board that has built that before has been absolutely transformational for the company. 
And that, I sort of talked down a little bit on the non-product aspects of, of, of building a company before, but execution can lead you to things like this. When we raised our A round in 2011, um, sort of the hypothesis that we said, that's the first round when you start talking about markets, right? This is the early adopter market for graph databases, and we thought it looked like this, like software, financial services, and telecom, along four use cases. This leads to a four by three matrix with 12 cells, right? And we didn't know this, this was a hypothesis based on the community usage that we saw, our understanding of what, where graph databases were good and where they weren't good. Um, and today we have the scorecard for this, right? So these are some of the customers, some of the public customers of ours today, not open source users, but actually paying customers, up and running in production today. And you can see small firms like Cisco, <laughs> and Trey, and HP, and SFR, um, and TomTom, Tom, and then startups like Glassdoor, and Snap, and Globo. That's been pretty amazing. But what's been even more amazing, though, is the traction that we've seen outside of this 4 by 3 matrix, where we've seen just industry after industry start adopting graph databases, and for use case after use case. And all these are companies that are now relying on our software in production to solve their business problems, which is pretty amazing. But they're also happy customers. This is one of my favorite tweets when I, when I, when I speak in Sweden. Two things Sweden gave to the world, Nina Passion from the Cardigans and neo 4 j Thank you, Sweden. That's my closest association with, with Nina Passion. I always try to sneak it in there. So okay, in summary then, we have three startup lessons learned. The first one is that product is the high order bit. That's truly what's controlling the outcome of the company. The second one is passion is not an optional, but a mandatory ingredient. And then actually people is the highest order bit. But then we have a bonus point. I'm not gonna let you on the stage just quite yet, but soon we'll get there. A bonus point. How many here has heard of crossing the chasm? Jeffrey Moore, crossing the chasm. Right, so uh, a theory on how you bring um, high technology products to the market, right? You start with, start with innovators and early evangelists, move to early adopters, and then maybe you move to early majority. And here's where you see a bunch of tech companies come and fail in the so-called chasm, because it turns out that the behavior that gets you into the early majority, the mainstream, is the exact opposite of the behavior that got you the early adopters in the first place. So very few companies managed to make that transition which is why it's called the chasm, right? And you can see how this fits together with our, our other transition curve theory, right? We pass the crash and burn, hopefully, we get the informed optimism, we use all of that informed optimism to swoosh by that chasm. See how it's hidden here when I overlaid the gifts on top of each other. So it has to be true, right? We just go from there to there, right? And we're absolutely here in 2014, and in 2015, now we're breaking into the mainstream, right? No, that's in theory. In practice, it looks like this. After you get to this informed optimism phase, there's a long, 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 long phase, right? And then you get to the innovators, and then if you're so lucky, you get to the early adopters, right? And we're here now, right? We have 75 of the global 2000, the 2000 biggest companies on the planet, 75 of them are now paying customers of Neo4j. We're still very much amongst early adopters, but we're looking at the chasm. We're seeing it right now. And I think that 2016 may be the year when we start crossing the chasm. So the final lesson learned then, number four, is persistence, right? Sticking in there. And that, I think, is my sort of final word of wisdom, if, if, if it is, or my fi final word of advice to the half of the people who are entrepreneurs in the room, right? that there's a lot of things that happen along the way, but the key thing I would say, if I had to scale away everything, remove everything, peel away everything, the one thing that has contributed to our success has been persistence. Thank you. So, we have time for questions. Do we have time for questions? Uh, I'm not really at uh, liberty to say.
take because I'm not long in the show. I'm just uh, a higher you're just the You're just the higher So I'll stay until you're ready. Okay, we're going to take two questions, and there's a mic here, so please raise your hand. In the meantime, I'm going to start with one question for myself. Hey, Emil, that was a great presentation. This sounds like a fantastic company. Are you hiring? Yes, we're hiring. We're hiring in Malmö. We're hiring in Stockholm. We're hiring in London. We're hiring in Silicon Valley. If you want to work with amazing technology, please come talk to me about that afterwards. Any questions, please raise your hand. My name is Ramzi Panami, right? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, I've worked with ERP systems before, and one of the main challenges I see here that people will first ask you how many developers actually work with your database. So if we use it as a solution and we have problems, who are we going to call? Like if you're in, uh, let's talk the MENA region, smart, you probably don't have support there. So who can we search for? Like if we are talking about Oracle, I know who to talk to. Yeah. But how would you sort out yeah. something like that? That's a great question. Spe specifically, what region did you ask about? Um, Middle East and North Africa. Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Like, there's no way that I can claim that we have anywhere near the scale of support that Oracle does, of course. Right? Um, having said that, two things. One is we have an extraordinary community. Right? Last year, in 2014, there were 500 events about the infrastructure, like an event like this, but more typically about the technology and the product. Right? 500. I had a coffee with the CTO of VMware two weeks ago, and he was like, wait, what? That's 10 times more events than VMware had in 2014, right? And that's the power of a vibrant community. So that's one thing. But that doesn't really address your question, because if you're a big company and you put this in, put this in production, you don't want to randomly call a community member who maybe picks up. You want to call someone who guaranteed will, 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 uh, will answer the phone. We do offer that. We have 24 by 7 support. We have people all over, we're 100 people now. People are all over the globe. We're carrying pagers, right? not all of us, but enough people are carrying pagers. And, and again, I mean, we have 75 people, 75 global 2000 companies who were comfortable enough with it that, they, that their business relies on it. If, we, if our database goes down, the revenue of Walmart, like Walmart is the Fortune 1 company. You know, the Fortune 500 list, they're the number one. They're the biggest company on the planet. Like, if our database goes down, their revenue is impacted, right? So, so I mean, so they, they, they rely on us. But, I mean, it's a real problem in terms of when you're a small startup, how can you do it? Did that address your question? Good, because I managed to sneak away from your question about the specific region. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> cool. One more question, and then move on to the next thing. So um, I have a very practical question. I, I run a small startup here, and we're using MySQL right now. So what I'd like to know is, if we were to start using your product, because we're actually a CRM layer on top of Facebook and Twitter and all those networks, uh, how would we? Sounds pretty graphy. Yeah. Uh, so how would we, in an extremely short version, how would we start using your product? I mean, it's extremely short version. Okay. Extremely short version is newfoche.com slash download. <laughs> download. <laughs> okay, a little bit longer. Um, I, I think it's about identifying the parts of your data set that is graphy, and then take that part and put that into Neo4j. I don't think if you're up and running right now with a, with a product that is using MySQL and is working, I don't think you should replace it. Uh, I think you should identify, hey, this is very graphy, let's put that into Neo4j. Maybe initially keep it both in MySQL and Neo4j. Run the fast queries over here and the slow queries over here, <laughs> right? And then over time, that, that's what we've seen is that people then, they start out that way. Over time, they migrate more and more of their stuff and ultimately all of their graphy stuff into Neo4j. Um, but I think that's the, that's the shortest version I can give you. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. I don't know if that addressed your question, but happy to talk more about it. And there's also a, a local team here in Stockholm. Carl is here somewhere, yeah. Feel free to talk to Carl. 
Um, and we have, uh, David isn't here, yeah, but we have, we have a team here in, in, in Stockholm. There's a meetup group, etc. Cool, that's it for me. Well, that's it for the first part of this, at least. Thank you very much. <laughs>